What do we see in the cosmos or on our planet? What about the detail and diversity of creatures, the sophistication of DNA, or extreme complexity of just one human cell? Evolutionists realize the dilemma. They all show design, and that demands a designer. In this episode, our guest examines the evidence of the creation model. He will also reveal how all the different skin colors of people could have come from just two individuals, Adam and Eve. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, One Race, Human, with Dr. Brad Harrop. Hello, welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. Brad Harab, holds a degree in biology and a doctorate degree in anatomy and neurobiology from the College of Medicine at the University of Tennessee. Currently, he serves as the executive director of Focus Press and co-editor of Think Magazine. Dr. Harab travels the world speaking on Christian evidences, fortifying the family, and cultural apologetics. Welcome to the program, Brad. Hey, Ray, it's great to be back with you. I love the title for this uh, program, One Race Human. Absolutely, you know, oftentimes when you fill out an application, they ask you, what race are you? I actually got in trouble once or twice, uh, college, medical school, for putting human and checking that box because they were wanting me to, to talk more about skin tones. And, and I believe very firmly there is one race, and that is the human race. I, I, I'd like to try that someday. Maybe I can get away with that. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I think the entire idea of race, racism, can be traced all the way back to a guy by the name of Charles Darwin. Darwin, who is oftentimes given credit as being the, the founder of the evolutionary theory, his original book, published in 1859, titled The Origin of Species, the full title was The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. And there's that word, races. That's what he was about. Absolutely. This, this part right here, you don't see in books anymore. They don't publish the full title anymore, and for obvious reasons. When you stop and think about who wants to, to think of Charles Darwin as being a racist, well, obviously evolutionists don't. But realistically, he most definitely believed that certain people were further evolved than others. He believed that there were inferior races. In his second book, The Descent of Man, he said this, the sole object of this work is to console firstly whether man, like every other species, is descended from some pre-existing form, secondly, the manner of his development, and thirdly, the value of the differences between the so-called Races of man. There's that word again. And, and you know, it's, it's Darwin that kind of planted the seed that all life evolved from a common ancestor. And so today, when kids pick up textbooks, they are very blatantly introduced into this evolutionary idea that we evolved from ape-like creatures. Here you see a, a Prentice Hall book that is, it, it's not suggesting it's actually coming out saying, hey, this is fact. They say, like all other forms of life, humans are products of evolution by natural selection. Um, this one's teaching the idea that you are an animal and you share common heritage with earthworms, of all things. This Harcourt Brace book is saying that humans probably evolved from bacteria that lived more than four billion years ago. And so what we see over and over is them trying to communicate this idea that humans evolved from some ape-like creature 
And along that progression, you had, you know, this particular race of people, this particular, and finally, eventually, we get to who Charles Darwin and Adolf Hitler believe were the superior race that is light-skinned people. I don't think that's what the Bible teaches, and I don't think that's what God intended when he talked about, for instance, that they had made blood or hath made for one blood all nations of men to dwell. You know, there's, there's not multiple segments in heaven of different colored people. Jesus didn't come to this earth to die for a certain skin color. Ultimately, we're all one race. Malachi chapter 2 verse 10 says this, Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? So, you know, the Bible teaches clearly when we talk about races, there's one. There's the human race. But Ray, we know there are differences in people. In fact, on the screen here you see uh, a, a dear friend of mine, a guy by the name of Carson Daly, he's Jamaican. And Brother Carson and I, we have spent lots and lots of time together. But if you look at those two pictures, you'll notice there's, there is a difference. And what I want us to do is I want us to talk about that difference. You know, if we really all came from Adam and Eve, how do we explain the rainbow of colors we see around us Today And so I, I want to walk up to the screen and uh, let's talk a little bit about the differences in skin color. Ultimately, skin color is caused by a biological pigment known as melanin. You know, e each and every person out there, they've got melanocyte cells. The amount of melanin that is in each one of those cells, you can see right here, it is actually a direct product of your mom and your dad. Now, Geneticists have come along and they've said, we're going to designate letters according to how much melanin somebody has in their skin. So we know this is a dominant trait. So they use, for instance, capital letters right here, big A, big A, big B, big B, for somebody who is really, really dark skinned, like my friend Carson, for instance. They use lowercase letters, little a, little a, little b, little b, for somebody who is very, very fair-skinned. Now, what, what would you call somebody, Ray, that has absolutely no melanin in their skin? It would be an albino. Albino. And, and if you've ever seen somebody with that particular condition, they almost kind of look like they're giving off a, a pinkish hue. It's not really a pinkish hue. They're actually kind of translucent. You're looking through their skin to the capillary bed below. But here's what I want us to do. I want us to use this information and figure out, could we start with two people, we'll, we'll call them Adam and Eve, and explain all the different colors that we see around us today. Like, for instance, what if Adam and Eve were both very, very dark skinned, kind of like my friend Carson. What if they were both big A, big A, big B, big B? All their children would be big A, big A, big B, big B, right? Yeah, that's the only genetic material that the children are coming from, so it couldn't be anything else. Absolutely, and so all, everybody on the planet, if this was the original makeup, everybody would be very, very dark skinned. Obviously, that's not what we see around us today. What about this? What if Adam and Eve had both been very, very fair skin. So little a, little a, little b, little b, what would all their children be? It'd be the same thing. There's no other genetic material to have. Exactly. Very, very fair skin. And again, that's not what we see around us today. Even though a lot of times churches will get vacation Bible school material, for instance, that has a, a blonde hair, blue eyed Eve, eh, that's a good chance that's not the case. <laughs> What we know today is there is a mixture around us of all kinds of different cultures of people. You've got Mongoloid or Asian, Kazakhoid, uh, Negroid. These are all, scientifically speaking, different cultures of individuals. Now, we got to ask this. What if God had started 
with one dark skin and one light skinned. Now, what we see on the screen, this is what geneticists call a Punnett square. And basically, the way you read it is we're going to put the father's genes across the top, the mother's down this left-hand side. So in this case, we're going to say this is Adam, and we're going to say this over here is Eve. We'll say Adam was really, really dark skin, capital letters. Eve was fair skin, lowercase letters. And so the way you predict what your offspring will be, you take father's genes, mother's genes, combine them together in each one of these 16 boxes. And in this case, all 16 are right down the middle tan. Now, obviously, that's not what we see today as well. And so, you know, somebody says, Brad, you're kind of running out of options. And that's true, but I still have one left. And that is, what if God had started with a mixture? In science, we call this heterozygous. If somebody had been big A, little a, big B, little b, and their spouse have the same genetic information, basically they would appear probably like a, a, a mocha color. Uh, I'm a coffee guy. I, I know what mocha drinks look like. By the way, a lot of the early events in the Old Testament happened in what we call the Fertile Crescent, an area that today we would call modern day, the Middle East, Iraq, Iran, and a lot of those people are kind of that mocha color. What are the possibilities of two people that have this skin color type? So again, we're going to call this Adam. We're going to call this Eve. We take Adam's skin color genes, Eve's. We combine them. You get everything from one very, very fair skin, four light tan, six tan, four darker brown, one very dark skin for a total of 16 and one very tired mother. <laughs> now, I can get you that with two. How many walked off the ark? Well, we have eight. Eight. You give me eight and you mix in the fact that today people can basically get in planes, trains, automobiles and, and be in different cultures, people are marrying between cultures, and you begin to see how we can have this, this rainbow of colors around us today. Now, I know there may be some viewers out there who are looking at this thinking, I, I don't believe that, that, that you can do that, that, that two people can give different colored children, and, and that's okay because I'm an evidence guy. It's what I do for a living. <laughs> So, for instance, this lady, young lady right here, her name is Cheryl Grant. She's asking the question, can you guess my secret? Her secret is that she has a twin sister who's black. And by the way, Cheryl Grant, she's not the only one. We, we actually see this in multiple cases where you've got sisters who have different complexions, different skin colors, and yet, the parents, exactly the same. Somebody says, okay, but Brad, you know, surely that doesn't explain how you've got a, a predominance of dark-skinned people around the equator, light-skinned people up in Europe. Surely that's evolution. And yet, again, the Bible gives us a good description of why this happens, how this could happen. In Genesis chapter 11, we read about the Tower of Babel. Now, if I ask why were the people dispersed? Was it because of skin color or because of language? It's the Tower of Babel. Obviously, it's their language. So if you imagine for just a moment, you've got a thousand people. We're going to say they're all right down here at the base of the Tower of Babel. They all speak Swahili, all different colors. They all migrate down towards the equator. Who do you think would fare better in that environment closer to the sun, dark-skinned or light-skinned people? Well, the light-skinned people are going to have a problem. <laughs> Absolutely. It's the dark skin, that melanin that actually protects them from the sun's harmful UV rays. The darker the skin, the more protection they've got. 
it's going to be fair-skinned folks like you and I that are going to go down there. We get burned at first, and then later we get skin cancers and such. Mm. And so hopefully it makes sense after a few short generations why there'd be a predominance of dark-skinned people there. Let's flip it. Let's say that we've got a thousand people all right here, all different colors, and they all speak Swedish. Again, all different colors. They all migrate up towards that particular part of, of Northern Europe. We ask the question, okay, is there any reason why after several generations there'd be a predominance of light-skinned people? Well, there's a couple of things we know about that part of the world. If you look at this map, you'll notice Northern Europe doesn't get a whole lot of sunlight. And we actually need sunlight. We use it to make vitamin D. Vitamin D allows us to absorb calcium. Without that, we're going to have all kinds of problems. Folks in that area that have a lot of melanin that are darker skin are actually not going to be able to absorb what little sunlight is available. And so in those areas, they're actually at a disadvantage. So it really makes sense then, lighter skinned folks, in fact, the only place where this rule is violated is the Eskimos. A darker skinned people don't get a whole lot of sunlight, and yet they get their sunlight or their vitamin D from the fish, the oils. Let's look at one more question that some folks may have, and that is this. Okay, if we really did come from Adam and Eve, how do we have four different blood types? Two people, four blood types. Well, here's what we know today. We know that types A and B blood are what we call co-dominant, meaning you can be AA or AO. In that case, you're both A blood type. Same thing with B. You could be BB or BO and still be considered B blood type. So the four different types we've got, A, B, AB, and O, are all given, and yet here's what we see. Two people, we'll call them Adam and Eve, could have very easily given all four blood types. And here's what I mean by that. Adam could be AO, Eve be BO, and you get AB, BO, AO, and O from just two people. Sadly, Charles Darwin was pushing really hard the idea that we evolve, that there are favored races, and yet what we know, realistically, we're created by God, made in His image. Right, I have to stop you right there. We need to take a break. Stay with us. We'll be right back after these messages. We hope you're enjoying Origins TV. It all started at Cornerstone Television in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've been producing new episodes for over 37 years now. We praise God for the success of the program and are excited to introduce you to Origins and to us. If you're interested in watching more episodes of Origins, you can find them on our YouTube page. Simply go to YouTube and search Cornerstone Television Network. Click the like and subscribe buttons, then you'll find the best episodes of Origins in our playlist. You can also visit our website at ctvn.org slash origins. One more way you can stay connected with us is to subscribe to our free monthly Hope Today newsletter, which you can do from our website. And if you have any questions, call us here at Cornerstone Television at 888-665-4483. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for watching. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking to Dr. Brad Harab, who's been sharing about one race, human. Brad, we saw in blood type that human beings could come from two people, just as the Bible teaches. Absolutely, all four blood types, two people. Two people, where are we gonna go next? So, I mean, the logical place is, if there is only one race, 
you know, if, if all blood types could come from just two people, um, then we got to talk a little bit about is there really proof that there's a God? Genesis chapter 1, 26, 27, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image, male and female, he created them. If this is true and there really is just one race, then we should be able to prove that God is real. So what I want to do is I want to give seven quick proofs that there really is a God. Because again, if we trace our lineage back to a guy named Adam and a lady by the name of Eve, if we really do believe the Bible, then how do we prove he's real? Number one, every creation must have a creator. We read in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4, every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, all things were created through him and for him. So, you know, for instance, we know that the universe exists. The question is, what caused it? Where did it come from? And ultimately, we know that something is God. Number two, every design must have a designer on the screen, I've, I've got a picture of something that younger folks may not recognize. These are sewing patterns, design patterns for ladies to make dresses. I can actually remember my aunt, my grandparents using these. You don't get a dress without some kind of design behind it. Likewise, you don't get a human or the universe without some kind of designer behind it. Isaiah said in Isaiah 42, 5, Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens, stretched them out, who spread the earth, and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk on it. When you think about the universe, when you think about the human body, there is design just screaming from the hilltops. Like you said, I mean, we, we recognize that with something as simple as a, a dress or, or a coffee cup, right? Absolutely. I mean, this couldn't have just evolved by erosion and wind. Exactly. And yet the human body. And when Made we, up of individual living cells. In each one of those cells, so complicated, so ordered. Oh. Absolutely. Number three, codes require somebody to program the code. You know, we, we recognize this in computer software. You don't get computer games, uh, different programs, unless you've got the right code. And in fact, if you have the wrong message in that code, it throws the whole program out. Likewise, in every cell of your body, you have got DNA, uh, a code that ultimately requires a programmer and the part for that code. You know, it's interesting, the, the world is, is looking for extraterrestrial aliens saying, hey, if we can find some code in outer space, that demands that there's life. And yet we have a code in every single one of our cells. Number four, every material effect must have an adequate cause that existed prior to it. We call this the law of cause and effect. You know, ultimately, if I told you, hey, that tsunami wave was caused by a little frog jumping into the water, you would say, no, 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 that, that's not a big enough cause to make that effect. Well, okay, then what caused the universe? Next, number five, laws require a lawgiver. James chapter four, verse 12 says, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. We recognize whether we consciously think about it or not every single day that there are laws of science out there. You've got the law of gravity, for instance, is, is a big one. When you got out of bed this morning, you expected your feet to go down and not up. We know about the law of gravity. We know about the laws of momentum. You don't get a law without a lawgiver. And so, again, another way that we can prove there's a God is the fact that these laws exist. Proof number six, we know we have a moral code. And the question is, all right, where did that come from? Did we evolve that from man? Or is it more logical to think that that came from God. They did a, a deal where they looked at various islands that weren't communicating together, realized those islands had a very similar moral code even though they weren't communicating with each other. They felt that things like stealing, lying, things like that were all wrong. 
Well, when you look at those behaviors as wrong, the question is, did they get it from man or God? And the only option that makes logical sense is we got it from God. He is eternal, he is holy, he is just and righteous, and ultimately he is forever consistent. Psalm chapter 119 verse 68 says, you're good and you do good, teach me your statute. So ultimately whatever he commands, approves or does is for our good. The last one is communication requires a communicator. I think sometimes we forget that human beings can actually build on knowledge. Animals don't have that capacity. You know, a bird, they, they don't think, oh, I've got a nest I need next time to put in central heat and air and, and satellite dish. No, they just keep building nests. Humans have the ability to communicate and build on knowledge. To pass on the, the knowledge that we've gained through language, which it communicates these ideas that we have that other, others can have. Absolutely. Brad, I want to thank you for being with us. This was a fascinating program. Absolutely. Thanks, Ray. And thank you for joining us. The theory of evolution as formulated by Charles Darwin has given rise to the idea that some humans are more evolved and so superior to others who are less evolved and so inferior. Darwin called these groups races and opined that the favored races would be preserved and the lesser ones eliminated. But when we examine the so-called races scientifically, we find that there is only one race, the human race. It just goes to show you that we know what the Bible says is true and the proof is all around you. If you enjoy Origins, we sure could use your help to keep this creation television program on the air. Your support, both prayerfully and financially, make a big impact. So let's work together to reveal how awesome our Creator truly is. And we'll see you next time on Origins. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 2402, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.